Good morning, everyone. We have some technical difficulties, and uh, as we try to set that going, uh, I'm going to uh, review uh, the messages that I have shared yesterday, because what we are about to share today is going to build upon uh, what we have shared last night. How many of you were here last night? Okay, so you got to help me to kind of review it together. We talked about Jesus being the essence of the gospel. Amen? We talked about how, how everything about Jesus is the gospel. His movement, his breath, and his facial expression, and his words, of course, everything about Jesus is the gospel. Amen? And that's why we are called to meditate upon Him each day, every moment of our lives. The more, we, the more we contemplate on Jesus, the more we observe Him, the more we meditate upon Him, the more we think about Him, the more we focus our eyes upon Him, we shall be changed like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. We don't have a built-in ability to change ourselves. But what's so, what's so amazing about, about human relationship is that while we are not able to change ourselves, we're, cha we're trying to change our other people. <laughs> and especially ladies are coming from a home improvement department. And they are trying to change their husband. <laughs> And but one thing very interesting about men, especially Korean men, Asian men, I think, the more outside force try to enforce you to be changed, the more they resist changing. <laughs> and famous scripture, favorite scripture that they like to quote is Jesus is same yesterday and today and tomorrow. <laughs> and we shall never change. And one of the tricks that I want to share with you is that if you have a marital difficulty and wanting your husband to be changed, and the favorite line the ladies use is like, if you truly love me, love me, why don't you change the way I want? And the man is like, am I not good enough for you? <laughs> you see, man wants security in relationship. You know, man wants to be accepted the way they are. And then when you accept them the way they are, then what happened? You see, if you accept them the way they are, that's how you grace them. That's how you grace them. You know, by accepting them for who they are. But what's so amazing about gracing them by accepting them for who they are, then they start changing the way you need. Amen? And so, so, we are called to give each other the grace of God in our relationship. Because one thing that I want to share with you, maybe, maybe it's better that we don't have a PowerPoint, okay? Because PowerPoint is not that powerful sometimes, you know? <laughs> okay, we have it, we have it. Now it's powerful, okay. Where's my computer? I need my computer. <laughs> yeah, let, let me have my computer here. So what I want to share with you is something really powerful, more than PowerPoint, <laughs> more than power, one of the most powerful things that you and I can experience in Christian life is that, get this, if you get this, this is a profound statement. Sometimes the preacher can share one sentence and if you really can catch the glimpse of what that message is all about, it will begin to change you. So I'm about to make some powerful and profound statement. The way God calls us to be changed in our relationship with each other. Only way for us to truly, truly change is by being in relationship with Christ in that when Christ begins to change you in his relationship with you and that's the way you become an agent of change in your relationship with other people. Isn't that true? And so 
the way we work out our horizontal relationship, the way we work out our horizontal relationship is caused by our vertical relationship. Amen? Amen. How we relate, how we work out our relationship really hinges upon how we are in our relationship with God. That's why when we have problem in our horizontal aspects of life, we got to focus on our vertical relationship with God first. That's the way we heal relationship. But one of the ways that God changes us in a, in a very fundamental and transforming way is that the way you can grace your spouse, the way you can grace your children, the way you can grace other people is really stemming from the fact that you and I are graced by God no matter what. Amen? The freedom, you can choose the way of freedom or you can continue to remain in the way of slavery. Slavery, you think that slavery is over. But Satan's way of life, slave of, of, slavery of sin continues even nowadays, even within the church. There are two ways of life, way of slavery, way of freedom. Way of slavery is operated by those who are slaves to sin. And then the way of freedom is operated by those who believe to be sons and daughters of God. I call it as a life of sonship. Life of slavery has everything to do with being conditioned by Listen very carefully. When your life is conditioned by how other people treat you, if your response is depend on how other people respond to you, then we, we are in a life of slavery. If someone else makes you happy, I like those responses here and there. It doesn't distract me, so continue on. <laughs> And if the Holy Spirit leaves you, you may take over my place here. <laughs> and make sure I get paid, okay? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> okay, so, so life of slavery has everything to do with your life being conditioned by how other people treat you. When you make your spouse make your life miserable, you become miserable. That is a life of slavery. When you expect something from your spouse, when you expect something from your children, and you're not getting what you need, and therefore, you're not going to give what the other person needs. And I met a husband, one guy, he's a nice guy, but his marriage is not working out. And then he came to me and said, Dr. Om, it's not working out. Maybe I need to find a way out. I said, what's going on? I know what my wife needs. I know how I should love my wife. It's not like I'm not able. But it's just, I don't feel like doing it anymore. <laughs> because I am not getting what I need from my wife. I feel like I'm pouring on a, like, you know, broken jar. And I talked to her and, and she, she said, my husband is the selfiest guy in the whole world. Because he just bought a bicycle that is worth of $6,000. If you just hear her, she, he sounds really bad. But like I said, when I met him, he's the nicest guy ever. But then she considered him selfish because she's not getting the love that he can only give. He is withdrawing that love from her. So for her, she's the self, he's the selfish. For him, he's not getting what he wants, and so he's not willing to give. And so then, they both are in this, what, vicious cycle. A man comes home from work and doesn't feel like being respected. House is in a mess. Wife doesn't work, but house is in a mess. You know that uh, 
Foods are all over the places. And he feels totally disrespected. Dinner is not done. He's hungry to death. And then he gets so angry and he starts like destroying things in the household. And thank God that he only chose the cheapest thing to destroy, like things from Kmart and stuff like that. <laughs> and then I met his wife. After the meeting, I was walking out and she was coming to me, fair looking lady. She came up to me and said, Dr. Um, I want to tell you that my husband and I are in that vicious cycle of relationship. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. It's not getting any better. My husband destroys the cheapest thing that he could find, but I'm finding myself destroying the most expensive thing in the household, like his computer. <laughs> because he plays computer game all night. Go to work, red eyes. How do you solve the relationship that gets so vicious like that and then that's getting worse and worse and worse every day? And only solution that we can find is in the gospel. In that the, the way we break away, the way we break the cycle of vicious relationship is to begin with God in that you and I come to Him in our brokenness. I thought I could satisfy my wife, no problem. But five years into my marriage, my wife is a wonderful lady, don't get me wrong. <laughs> and five years into my marriage I came to realize that even though I married her for love and I married her with passion but I realized that I didn't have the agape love that she needed whatever that is I didn't have it and she didn't have it either so what? So what do we do? Walk on our separate ways? No. My wife, literally, not literally, symbolically, my wife kicked me in the pants. <laughs> not say literally, not literally. <laughs> and she kicked me in the pants and said, you know what, son? You need to work it out with God. And I said the same thing to my wife. Honey, I thought I could meet all your needs. I thought I could be the king of your life. But I can't. All of your unresolved needs and all of your unresolved issues, all of your needs and longing that you have, there is no way I can meet those needs on my own. You got to go to God to be fulfilled. Pascal once said that there is a God-shaped vacuum in each and every one of us. And that is something that God can only feel. Amen? Amen? And so I went downstairs. There is a storage room. I went in and I started praying, Lord, I don't have the love that it takes to build a godly marriage. Those were the worst time of my life where I have to give Bible study to people and then the topic was on unconditional love. Lord, I can't do it. <clears throat> I remember a time studying God's Word. That's why I, share, I, I carry this Bible wherever I go. This is 25-year-old Bible. <laughs> I bought this Bible. If you want to get on a journey with God, buy an expensive Bible. Leather-bound Bible. Buy a Bible that has margins like I do have. I know everybody has their Bible on their um, you know, iPad, iPhone and iPad. That's nice. But something that you can write on, something that you can put a mark on, you know, something that you can mess up with. And I got the Bible. I start reading the Bible. I start meditating on it every day, knowing and believing that 
God never fails to grace those who come to Him. Amen? Amen. If you are hungry after God, I can more than assure you, Holy Spirit has already started to work in your life. Because you can't have a hunger for God without Him giving you that hunger. Amen? Amen? When you're hungry for God, you are so blessed. Do you know that that's the first beatitude? Blessed are those who are what? Poor in spirit. For theirs is the what? Kingdom of God. You know what? I like the translation that is given by Eugene Peterson. You know how Eugene Peterson translated it? I like the way he translated it on Message Bible. He says, Blessed are those who are at the end of the rope. For those who are at the end of the rope, Eugene Peterson says, More of God and less of you. Amen. Amen? Amen? In a way, I was at the end of my rope, crying out before God, trying to observe and immerse into the Word of God. And then the grace of God started to come to me in a way that is, that's words cannot express, in a crazy way, in a powerful way. Every word pops out in front of me, and I, I felt like I was falling in love with God all over again. Amen. Have you ever been in that first love with God and have lost in touch with that first love with God? Maybe it's about time to restore that. And when I was longing to be graced by God, I was starting to look at my wife, and then she started to look more than beautiful. I was like, I'm so lucky to marry this woman in my life. I always thought that she was the lucky one, but now I realize that I'm the lucky one. My sister came from Korea. My sister came from Korea, and then she was looking at me. She was looking at her, and then she had that look on her eyes. How did she get him? <laughs> but when I was graced by God, I came to realize that I am graced by God to be in this relationship. Amen. So I started to cook. Korean men don't cook. <laughs> Korean men sit on the table and then chopstick comes, everything comes in five minutes. <laughs> My father came from Korea, such a powerful man. My father sat on the table, within five minutes, everything was there. All he had to do, pray and eat. <laughs> I said, wow, what a model, so powerful. <laughs> So I sat down on the dining table, nothing was coming. <laughs> I had to go get my chopstick. <laughs> and then I had to do the dishes. When I was overwhelmed by the grace of God, first time in my life, I heard of the grace. I heard of God's grace, but I never experienced it. Even five years into my marriage, five years into my ministry, I knew about grace, but I didn't know grace. Big difference. I remember the first day I started to cook. I didn't know what to cook. And there was an oatmeal. I said, this is an easy thing to do. Just put water in it and then boil. It was 7 o'clock in the morning. I, I thought it would be nice to have something for my wife because we had three kids. My wife is tired. So in the morning, I cook oatmeal. But making oatmeal wasn't that easy. <laughs> I burnt it. And then my wife came out because she smelled something. <laughs> Ladies have a tremendous smell. That's, they know if, if you've been with other women, they can smell it. That is why I don't mess around. 
And my wife, my wife smelled the burning smell. She came out. She saw that I made oatmeal, but it was burnt. My wife is a wonderful lady. She was humorous. Honey, you're so nice to cook for us. Let's offer a burnt offering to the Lord. <laughs> was the beginning of the rekindling of our mar marriage relationship. And then when I'm graced by God, when I'm graced by God, I am free to give even if I don't receive what I need. That's the freedom that book of Galatians is talking about. Not a freedom that enables you to indulge in sin, but freedom that enables you to love no matter what. Amen? Because what? Not because you receive it from the other, but because you receive it from the Lord always, who never ever fails. Amen? I remember preaching a sermon when I was at Spencerville Church. I was fresh off the boat. You know FOB? I still smell like kimchi. <laughs> and uh, I still have the kimchi sound in my sermon. And there was a little girl sitting in the front row. I can thank her enough, but at that time I wasn't. She was sitting down whenever I preach a sermon, she would write down the mispronunciation I have made. <laughs> this little girl would come up to me and said, Pastor, um, today you made 18 mistakes. <laughs> And she would say, you are improving. <laughs> I almost wanted to slap her. <laughs> Lord, make her rapture. <laughs> and she just said, you don't believe in rapture, right? And my, my, that, that, that little girl has taught me a lot about God's grace. And then one day, I decided to grace those who misbehave in worship service. I decided to write down their names, those sinners list. <laughs> those misbehave and interrupt, wrote down their name, it came out to be about six or seven. After the sermon was over, I called on their names. Sinners has a way of feeling guilty. I didn't say anything about the nature of their sin, but they all looked repentful already. They were coming in front of me and said, Pastor, what's going on? Why are you calling us? And I said, I want to meet you guys in Pizza Hut on this coming Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. I want you to come to the Pizza Hut because I want to treat you. And they're like, they all had this puzzled look. Why, why are you treating us with pizza? They all wanted to know, and I said, just come. On Tuesday night, everyone came. <laughs> and I gave them pizza. They were asking why I was treating them. I didn't say anything. I love you guys. Just eat. Man, little did I know that the power of pizza When I ordered the pizza, I said, extra cheese. <laughs> and then when kids were eating the pizza, something was going on. And then next Sabbath, I went to church and I started preaching a boring sermon once again. And then those kids who were bribed with pizza were sitting in the front row and then they were policing everybody to be quiet. <laughs> That's how I survived my, my preaching ministry. <laughs> when you receive grace from the Lord and you always have so much to give. And when you're learning to share with others, with your family and friends and others, when you're learning to grace others when they don't deserve it and yet when they need it the most. The more you grace, 
the more you receive to grace, even more. Amen. Amen? I hope you are hungry for God. I hope you are hungry for the grace that God can only give us. Ephesians chapter 2, let's take a look at the Bible. If you have your Bible, no more PowerPoint today. I only have five more minutes to preach. <laughs> I want us to open up the scripture, Ephesians chapter 2. If you have your Bible, open with me. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms. In Christ Jesus, verse 7, is what I want us to focus on. In order that in the coming ages He might show, He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His what? Kindness. Man, God's grace coming to you in the form of kindness. So when you get to heavenly gate and you ask Jesus, Lord, why did you save me? And then He will say, I just decided to be kind to you. God's kindness goes far goes deep. In that, he says, Paul uses this kind of uh, expression. He says, inexpressible riches of his grace. I mean, his grace is already limitless, but it, he says the riches of his grace makes it even greater, and then inexpressible, making it even greater. It is bigger than the biggest, greater than the greatest. It's called mega, mega grace of God coming to you. I want to tell you this morning, you and I, you and I haven't touched even the surface of God's grace. Amen? Amen. We haven't even touched the surface of it. And I want us to go deeper in God's grace. Immerse yourself in deeper in God's grace. First Peter chapter 3 tells us that grow in the knowledge of Jesus and the grace of God. The same thing. The more you grow in the knowledge of the more you grow in your relationship with Christ, the more you grow deeper in your love relationship with God, the more you're passionate about Jesus Christ, and the more you grow to be able to grace others the way they need, and you become a transforming agent of change in the lives of people. Amen? Let us not be bogged down by how we are treated by other people. Let us not be, allow ourselves to be sabotaged, allow ourselves to be bondaged in a way we are being treated. And then respond to others in a reactive manner, the way we receive, the way we respond. No. The way we receive through Christ, the way we bless others in a transforming manner. You can choose way of freedom today. Or you can stubbornly, proudly, arrogantly, ignorantly remain staying in that rotten and, and death-driven life of slavery. What would you like to choose? God has given us the way of freedom. Amen? Amen. God wants us to choose the way of freedom and way of freedom has everything to do with the way of God's grace don't don't ever ever limit God and what God can do in your life amen, amen. and I'm going to end this, this thought when the pastor come up it is a sign that I should end <laughs> and he's gracing me amen <laughs> And I want to end with this thought. It may blow your mind away. I want to end this, with this thought. This afternoon will continue. When Jesus comes in the last days, those who shall be saved are called 144,000. 
I know you, you, you might be asking, what, what does 144,000 has to do with grace? Did you know that 144,000 has everything to do with grace? You can argue about if, whether it's a literal number or symbolic number. But if you look at you know, Revelation chapter 7 through 9, it is very clear that it is a symbolic number because 144,000, if you did Kuman, you would know. <laughs> 144,000 equals with 12 times 12 times 1,000. Right? 12 times 12 times 1,000. 12 in the Bible is the number that represents plentifulness. You remember after Jesus fed 5,000 people, which is actually including men and including women and children, equals to be 20,000 people. After Jesus fed 20,000 people, how many baskets of bread were left over? 12. 12 in the Bible signifies it's a kingdom number. 12 disciples, 12 gates of heaven. So 12 in the Bible is a kingdom number because it represents the plentifulness of God's grace. And then the, those who will be saved, those who are saved, those who are part of 144,000, they are the one who experience the plentifulness of God's grace, abundant grace of God, inexpressible riches of God's grace in such a way that it will be like 12 times, 12 times, what? And thousand. That means plentiful that they will be saved by the plentifulness of God's grace. They are the one who continue to experience and grow in the grace of God exponentially and then inexpressibly and to a point where it is so plenty and then you times it 12 again and then that's not enough and then you times it with thousand. God's grace is so abundant, so powerful enough that while it saves you as you are, it will never ever leave you as you are. It will transform you. It will change you. It will change our thoughts and mind and our, our even, even our cells to a cellular level. It, it will change the impulses of our lives. It will change our feelings. It will change our outlook on life. It will change everything about us in such a way that in this world of sin, in this world of getting, in this world of reactivism, in this world of slavery, God is calling you today to be an agent of God to share the, this abundant and amazing grace of God in this sin-darkened world. Amen. How many of you desire to respond to that grace today? How many of you desire to be an agent of God's grace today? And I pray that God's blessing would be abundant to each and every one of us as we continue to go with Him from this day on. Amen? Amen. May you and I grow in his grace. Amen. And this afternoon, after the potluck, I want you to stay. I almost wanted to barricade the entrance so that no one can go. <laughs> but I know that is not God's way. <laughs> and if you want to learn more about God's grace this afternoon, I have a message for you. And hope you stay and share God's blessing together. The PowerPoint that I wasn't able to share this morning, I will continue. I want to bless you with the amazing grace of God. And when Jesus comes, when Jesus comes, you and I will be called as an ambassador of God. Can you believe that when Jesus comes, you and I will be called as an ambassador of God and then the Mars will call on you. Mr. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so, Miss So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, I want you to come and speak to us. How many people you are? We have about a billion people here. And I want you to talk about the way God has graced you and enabled you to conquer the unconquerable. I want you to come and share your testimony of how God enabled you to overcome depression, overcome insurmountable challenges in your life. I want you to come and share the resurrection power of God. Amen. Amen.
You're going to be the speaker, and I'll be the gatekeeper. And I'll be praying for you. You and I are called by God on this journey. On this journey of ever, ever growing in God's grace. Which will never end. Even after we go to heaven, that journey of grace will continue. Continue to grow to the full statue of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. I invite you to this journey. And I pray that God's abundant grace would be real in all of our lives today and on. Amen. Amen.